Good afternoon, students. Today's class is about the pericardium. Yes. Uh, so yesterday we were doing the cardiovascular system. So from the cardiovascular system, so when you are doing the cardiovascular system, I think we have covered the uh, things. What the cardiovascular system consists of. Mm. So today we start with that of the pericardium with the external features of the of the heart. Uh, so first going out uh, with that, what is that of the pericardium? What you can come across in that of the pericardium? Yes, wait, wait, first. Yes. So what things that you come across? So what is the pericardium? So pericardium is the uh, outermost covering of the heart. So with the heart, when you are seeing the heart, uh, yesterday I think you, you have come across uh, some features we have discussed about the heart. So with the heart, uh, when you are seeing, I think you might have come across uh, parts what we are seeing it. So there I have told about the what is the size of that of the heart, how many things will be there. So, what are the coverings and uh, what is the size? It would be size of the. Yes, I was seeing whether it is live streaming or not uh, because of that I crossed it. Okay. okay, so it is live streaming uh, because earlier only you had the class of uh, GIT. Um, yeah, one thing I would like to tell you, so all the classes are going back to back. So um, I knew you are facing a little bit problem of uh, taking all the classes um, back to back. But if you have any doubts, yes, uh, we are linked with your WhatsApp group. So please, if you having, uh, you will have some doubts. So if you have any doubts, whether it might be big or small, please keep a message to her so that we will try to uh, uh, clear the up to our part of the knowledge so whatever you have the doubt you can keep it in english or whatever you are language except in malayalam any of the top part of the language that we are comfortable you can keep it so that we can um, uh, clear that doubt we'll try to clear it because all the classes they are going back to back so earlier you have heard a class of one hour about the git system uh, followed by that uh, what uh, from yesterday what I was telling was about the cardiovascular system so when the cardiovascular system if, if you have heard the yesterday's class or if you have seen the live streaming if you are having that one so in next day's class uh, in the cardiovascular system what we have covered is so what we have covered is the components of this cardiovascular system which includes the blood heart and the blood vessels so in that class what i have tried to told, uh, try to tell it for you is what the blood what is the blood what are that of the uh, heart in the heart what i told is only the um, uh, only the uh, i have only introduced the heart so what would be the size what are the chambers of the heart but i have not gone deep into it because uh, we can go deep as is the classes are going on Next, uh, followed by that, I have told about the blood vessels. It might be artery, vein. So, I have told along with what does the artery is carrying on from where to where it is away from the heart it will be carrying, whereas the veins bring deoxygenated blood. Um, along with that, uh, I try to do with the, some histological concepts like uh, uh, when you see the blood vessels, the blood vessels uh, have three layers such as tunica, intima, media, and adventitia. Along with it, uh, the last part was about the clinical aspect of the vessels or the of the cardiovascular system. So, following the same thing, so today's class, what I am telling is exclusively from now, whatever the classes about uh, three to four classes would be, I would be taking on the cardiovascular system. So, it is only to the top of the only uh, it is strictly uh, to the top of the heart only so i would be staying in one class about the pericardium in one external features of the heart 
right atrium means all the chambers right atrium uh, next is left atrium with left ventricle uh, right ventricle so in that i would be going with that of the clinical aspect wherever it is possible at your part that means at the part of the nursing point so just now going to that of the pericardium yes what is pericardium the pericardium is a fibrous sac it is a fibrous sac which is covering that of the heart so the heart that we have seen it is present in the thorax in the middle media stadium it is present so that heart is covered by means of that of the pericardium so if you see here so this is the heart yes conical structure so this is the heart so surrounding the heart you are seeing some covering so this covering is this covering is a fibrocerus sac means a part is of the fibrous material a part is that of the serous part means so the pericardium what it is made up of it is a fibrocerus sac so it is a part it is made up of a fibrous part it is made up of the serous part so both together we say the pericardium is a fibrocerus sac yes so pericardium as such i have said it is a fibrocerus sac means a part of it is made up of a fibrous part a, pa a part of it is having serous part so this covering has two components fibrous and serous which is surrounding the heart and also the root of the great vessels so what pericardium is a covering of the heart so heart is covered by that of the pericardium it is not only covering the heart it is also covering the great vessels great vessels is your aorta so it is also covering that of the great vessels so not only the, the heart it is also covering that of the great vessels that is the root of the great vessels next as we have said the pericardium is having two components yes fibrous and serous so when you see here the two components are outer fibrous pericardium and inner serous pericardium so when you see here yes i think you can see here the green uh, color what it is indicating is the outer fibrous pericardium the black color what you are seeing yes which is again divided into two yes it is again divided into two that is the serous pericardium so this is a fibrous pericardium this layer is a serous pericardium so pericardium has having two components one is fibrous one more is a serous pericardium yes next the inner serous pericardium whatever you are seeing that black layer yes so this black color coating the inner serous pericardium you can see here this is the inner serous pericardium so this layer what you are seeing is a inner serous pericardium this inner serous pericardium is again divided into two so this is uh, again you can see it is again dividing into two which is outer parietal pericardium this is the outer layer is called as parietal pericardium the inner layer which is covering the heart which is covering the heart is called as visceral pericardium so this serous pericardium is again divided into outer parietal pericardium and inner serous pericardium sorry inner visceral pericardium so this is the inner visceral pericardium so this is parietal pericardium which is covering which is inside so this is the parietal pericardium and this which is covering the heart which is to the heart which can be inseparable means it cannot be separated so that is called as that of the visceral pericardium so you can see the two components you have seen the pericardium as such we have said it consists of outer fibrous and inner serous the out inner serous is again divided into outer parietal layer and inner visceral layer when you see this inner serous pericardium this two layers it is parietal layer and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium both are continuous at the root of the great vessel so when you see it at the root of the great vessel so we have said earlier also pericardium is not only covering the heart it is not only covering the heart it is also covering the 
great vessels it is also covering the root of the great vessels so when you see the serous pericardium at the root of the great vessels it is continuous it is continuous so you can see the parietal pericardium means the serous pericardium which is divided into parietal layer and the visceral layer both these two layers at the root of great vessels are they are both the two layers are continuous so you can see the parietal and visceral layer which are continuous so that is the point that you have to remember so the two layers it is parietal layer and visceral layer of inner serous pericardium are continuous at the root of the great vessels one more so when you see that a space there is a space between the serous pericardium which is as such we have described it consists of two layers outer parietal layer and inner visceral layer between the outer parietal and inner visceral layer you can see a cavity is present uh, the space is present so this is a space that you are seeing this space is called as pericardial cavity so this is called as a pericardial cavity this pericardial cavity is having some fluid that is pericardial fluid will be present within this cavity which is helpful for that of the heart for pumping for pumping action this pericardial fluid is have it is acting as a friction or it is helpful for the heart for that of the pumping action so when you see this is a narrow fluid space is present that narrow fluid space is called as pericardial cavity this pericardial cavity consists of some fluid pericardial fluid is present which is helpful for the heart for its proper functioning so this is about the of a part of the of the pericardium that you are seeing yes next when you take a section same pericardium when you take take the section of the heart how does it goes so when you are taking the section of the heart this is the section yes this is the sagittal section of the heart so you can see in front this is the sternum so the sternum that is a manubrium sternum this is called as a xiphi sternum which consists again consists of costal cartilages or ribs will be coming in front behind is that of the vertebrae so these are that of your cervical and that of your thoracic vertebrae with along with the part of lumbar but heart comes up in that of your thoracic vertebrae so above is that of the first rib below is that of the diaphragm this is the diaphragm so when you take the sagittal section sagittal section of the heart you can see the outer layer that you are seeing same the outer layer is a pericardium which is a fibrous pericardium the inner layer the black layer that you are seeing is a serous pericardium within this is serous pericardium you can't see the two layers very clearly as such earlier what you have seen it consists of outer is that of the parietal pericardium the one which is adherent to the heart is a visceral pericardium in between that white part you can think as a parietal layer the the one which is to the heart is a visceral in between it that gap that black color what we are seeing is a pericardial cavity or the gap is present which consists of the pericardial fluid is present so this is a sagittal section of the of the heart of the pericardium actually this is sagittal section of the heart but what clearly what we are going we are seeing in this pic is a pericardium so we are going only the pericardium the fibrocerus sac we are seeing here yes now as we have said the pericardium is a fibrocerus sac so when you are seeing as a fibrocerus sac we will be seeing the first what is a fibrous pericardium what is its nerve supply then we will be seeing the serous pericardium so when you are seeing the fibrous pericardium if you remember here i think you can see so this is the fibrous pericardium the name itself we are saying that it has a fibrous yes when you see the apex part of the heart the apex of the heart is blunt fused to the root of the great vessels so with the pericardium and its that of your pulmonary uh, pleural fascia which is fused so the apex of the <coughs> of the fibrous pericardium 
is blunt and it is fused with the root of that of the great vessel so this is the fibrous pericardium so this is the apex part which is uh, don't think this is the apex of the heart it is a, a cone part or the upper part you think as it's the upper part because you might be confusing when you are seeing the external features of the heart but the fibrous pericardium when it is coming to the top of the great vessel so it is the root of the top of the great vessels what you are seeing at that part so it is fused the fibrous pericardium is fused to that of the root of the great vessels so it is here what we are seeing it is fused here means it can't be separated here it is fused with the root of the great vessels same way when you see at the base the fibrous pericardium is again merging with that of the diaphragm so here the fascia which is a diaphragmatic fascia so it is again this is a diaphragm uh, which is demarcating the thorax from that of the diaphragm in thorax from the top the abdomen so the base is inseparable from the top the diaphragm that is inseparable from the top the diaphragm which is conjoined or it is closed or it is melted or molded with the top the diaphragm that it can't be separated so when you see the fibrous pericardium at the apex and at the base at the apex it is fused to the great vessels at the base it is merging with or inseparable with that of the diaphragm so when you are seeing here so this is the part so fibrous pericardium at the root of the great vessels it is merging or it is blending with that of the root of the great vessels here you can see it, it is with that of the diaphragm next the other points of the fibrous pericardium is anteriorly we have seen the apex and the base where it is the apex and that of your base of the fibrous pericardium the apex is blending with that of the great vessels this is that of the base which is blending with that of the diaphragm now we will see anteriorly what is fibrous pericardium is doing posteriorly what it is doing when you see this one anteriorly it is attached to the sternum by the ligament which is called as a sterno pericardial ligament so when you see here so this is the fibrous pericardium anteriorly when you see the anteriorly the anteriorly it is attached because in front of the heart is a sternum so sternum is attached to the heart by means of a ligament or the fibrous pericardium which is called as sterno pericardial ligament the sterno pericardial ligament is a ligament which is attaching it is attaching the fibrous pericardium to that of the sternum so when you have seen the heart the heart is covered by that of your outer fibrous inner serous yes to that of the that outer fibrous pericardium is adherent to that of your sternum because in front of the heart what comes is the sternum so that sternum is getting attached to that of the heart by means of a ligament which is called as that of the sterno pericardial ligament so that ligament which is present between the sternum and the pericardium that fibrous pericardium is called as a sterno pericardial ligament that is the anterior relations of the fibrous pericardium when you see the posterior relations of the fibrous pericardium the posteriorly it is related to the principal bronchi and the top the esophagus so this is the fibrous pericardium so when you are seeing it anteriorly this is a fibrous pericardium it is attaching to the trochlear sternum this is the trochlear sternum which is present between the sternum and the fibrous pericardium the ligament which is present is called as sterno pericardial ligament so here the ligament which will be coming is a sterno pericardial ligament posteriorly the fibrous pericardium is related to that of the principal bronchi and the esophagus so this is the posterior surface of the pericardium fibrous pericardium which will be relating here to that of the esophagus so esophagus will be present other than that but if you remember either side of the heart two lungs will be present lungs here one and one more lung a pair of organs so these will be present so behind posteriorly it is related to the principal bronchus with that of the esophagus so anteriorly the fibrous pericardium is related to the sterno pericardial ligament posteriorly it is related to that of the esophagus with that of the principal bronchi of the lung yes on each side as we have said each side heart it consists of the lungs so lungs are covered by means of the ductus 
pleura so on each side it is related to the mediastinal pleura so when you see here so on each side each side of that of your heart so this is the heart what you are see as we have told here there will be one lung here there will be other so the covering of the lung is called as it of the pleura so on each side the fibrous pericardium is related to the pleura because it is present in the heart is present in the mediastinum and the covering that pleura type of pleura is called as mediastinal pleura so on each side the fibrous pericardium is related to the mediastinal pleura okay what this fibrous pericardium nerve supply is the nerve supply for the fibrous pericardium is a phrenic nerve that which is innervating the diaphragm so phrenic nerve is also innervating the diaphragm it is also supplying to the duffel fibrous pericardium so the fibrous pericardium is supplied by the nerve supply is from the of the phrenic nerve when you come across a function what is the main function of the fibrous pericardium it protects the heart from sudden overfilling so whenever there is sudden overfilling of the heart that sudden overfilling of the heart is protected by means of the fibrous pericardium so it is protected by means of that of the fibrous protein so overfilling of the heart or the over distension of the heart is protected by means of the fibrous pericardium so this is about the fibrous pericardium next i will be repeating again huh? let's see the next pericardium also that is a Mm, serous pericardium so here what we came across this picture is anterior relation of the fibrous pericardium it is related to the stenopericardial ligament posteriorly it is related to the esophagus and the bronchus but either side because here the lungs are coming either side so this will be that of the two lungs that is the mediastinal pleura so here this picture will be showing the relations of the fibrous pericardium yes this is the nerve as we have said whole of the fibrous pericardium this outer fibrous pericardium is innervated or the nerve supply is by means of the of your phrenic nerve so you can see the phrenic nerve it is supplying to the fibrous pericardium and also to that of the diaphragm for that of your fibrous pericardium and to the diaphragm so the nerve supply of the fibrous pericardium is by means of that of your phrenic nerve next as we have said pericardium is a fibro serous sac so we have up till now dealt with the fibrous pericardium let's see the serous pericardium which is double layered so when you have seen here the serous pericardium we have seen here the picture so this is a serous pericardium which is double layered means outer is a parietal pericardium inner is a visceral pericardium in between the two outer parietal and inner visceral there is a space which is called as a pericardial cavity yes this is a thin double layer sinus membrane lined by mesothelium so serous pericardium is a thin double layer serous membrane it is a thin double layer serous membrane which is lined by the mesothelium it consists of two layers the outer layer is a parietal layer as we have discussed the inner is a visceral pericardium when you see the two layers they are continuous with each other so as such when i was saying about the serous pericardium also have said that the two layers of the serous pericardium are continuous at the root of the great vessels so the root of the great vessels is the arch is the aorta pulmonary trunk at that part you can see the parietal pericardium is continuous with that of the visceral pericardium so this is a parietal pericardium which is in continuous with that of the visceral so this is a visceral pericardium this is a parietal so both are continuous at the root of the great vessels and that of the pulmonary trunk so both are <coughs> both the serous pericardium are continuous at the root of the great vessels as we have said the serous pericardium consists of two layers that is a visceral layer and the parietal layer the parietal layer that it is outside but the visceral layer is that layer if you have seen the earlier picture also you were not able to see very clearly so very clearly you can't see the visceral pericardium because it is adherent to that of the heart so when you are seeing is this layer is called as a visceral pericardium it is very much adherent to that of the heart you can't separate the visceral pericardium 
from that of the heart. So it is very much to remember the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is adherent to the heart. As we have said, between the parietal fibrous pericardium and serous pericardium, or within the serous pericardium, what we have said, the two layers, parietal layer and the inner visceral layer, there is a cavity is present, <coughs> which is called as a pericardial cavity. It is a space between the outer parietal and the inner, with the outer parietal layer and the inner visceral layer. There is a space. That space, that potential space is called as a pericardial cavity. So, I think as shown earlier also. So, this space, this is outer parietal layer, this is the inner visceral layer. So, in between these two layers of the serous pericardium, there is some potential space. So, this is a potential space that you can see between that of the outer parietal and that of the inner visceral layer you can see. So, this space or the cavity contains a thin film of capillary fluid. So, it consists of thin fluid of that of the capillary fluid is present which is helpful for that of your heart to do its function. So, whenever the heart is doing its function means pumping action. So, for smooth running of that it contains the cavity consists of a thin layer of capillary fluid which is helpful for, of its, for its function. So, this is about the serous pericardium. So, before going to the sinuses, so there are some spaces, sinuses are the spaces. Before going, let us let us review about, again review about that of the pericardium itself again. So, the uh, pericardium, whenever we are saying what is a pericardium, the pericardium is a covering of the heart. It is a simple way, it is a covering of the heart. It is not only covering the heart, it is also covering the great vessels like iota and that of the pulmonary trunk. These are the great vessels. So, whenever we are saying it is the covering of the heart, do remember, make it a point, it is not only covering the heart, it is also covering the great vessels. First, when you are saying the pericardium, the pericardium is a fibrocerous sac. Means you can <coughs> see a part of the pericardium is fibrous and a part of the pericardium is the serous. So, it is a fibrocerous sac we say it. So, pericardium is a fibrous serous sac which is outer fibrous and inner serous pericardium. So, we are seeing the outer fibrous pericardium, that green color one we are seeing. This is the outer fibrous pericardium it, it is seen. So, this is the outer fibrous pericardium. When you see clearly, you can see the outer fibrous pericardium is blending at the apex, means it is blending with the root of the great vessels at the upper part. Below it is blending with that of the diaphragm. So, this is the diaphragm. So, when we are speaking about the fibrous pericardium, in the deep, with the relations of the fibrous pericardium, what it is? So, when you see at the apex and the base, the apex, the fibrous pericardium is covering the great vessels at the part the base, it is with that of the diaphragm. When you see in front and behind, it's anteriorly and posteriorly of the fibrous pericardium. Yes, so this is a fibrous pericardium. So, anteriorly the fibrous pericardium is adherent to that of the sternum. So, this is the sternum. It is by means of a ligament. So, there should be a ligament because of which the pericardium is a fibrous. So, which is called as stenopericardial ligament. So, the ligament which is present here, it is called as this ligament which is called as sternopericardial ligament which is related anteriorly to that of the fibrous pericardium. Posteriorly, that fibrous pericardium is related to that of the esophagus and the bronchi. Means, either side of the heart, there will be lungs. So, posteriorly, it is related to that of the esophagus with that of the bronchi. When you see the nerve supply of the fibrous pericardium, the fibrous pericardium is innervated by the nerve that is a phrenic nerve and the most important thing of it is it protects the heart from the sudden overfilling. So, this is about the fibrous pericardium. So, when we have set the fibrous outer covering, apex it is blending the great vessels means it is fusing to the root of the great vessel. Base it is covering that of the diaphragm, inspirable from the diaphragm it can't be separated. Anteriorly, it is attached to that of the sternum by stenopericardial ligament. 
Posterior date is related to the principal bronchus and the esophagus. I think I was clear when I was going on through my diagram or the uh, slide. So anteriorly it is related to the sternum by means of a ligament, sternopericardial ligament. Posteriorly is it is related to the esophagus and the principal bronchi. Yes. Next, coming to that of your innervation. It is innervated by the nerve that is a phrenic nerve and the most important thing is what is it is doing? It protects the heart from the sudden overfilling. Whenever the sudden overfilling is there, so fibrous pericardium is the one layer which is protecting that of the heart. After that what we have done is the serous pericardium. What is this serous pericardium? So, when you are seeing, first I will describe again in that of your picture only. So, this is the serous pericardium. You can see the serous pericardium, the black one, the two layers. You can see outer one black, inner one. The serous pericardium is that layer which is consists of two layers. These two layers, when you can see the picture very clearly, you can see at the root, means at the root of the great vessels, they are continuing. Means one layer is continuing with that of the other. So, this outer layer is called as a parietal peri pericardium. The inner layer of the serous pericardium is a visceral pericardium which is also called as an epicardium. This visceral pericardium or epicardium can't be separated because it is adhered to that of the heart. And this pericardium what you are seeing is away from that of the heart which is called as parietal pericardium. In between the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium, there is a cavity is present. So, this is a cavity. What we are seeing, this is called as a pericardial cavity, which consists of thin layer of the capillary fluid, which is helpful for the, uh, the heart to do its function. So, whatever the points that you are coming across here is the same thing. I have kept the same thing. The serous pericardium is a double layered. You have seen the two black layers, that is a double layered. Lined by mesothelium, it consists of two layers, the outer is a parietal layer, yes the inner is a visceral layer. Next point, the two layers are continuous at each other at the root of the great vessels, I think I was clear in my description. You can see here, the two layers are continuous with each other at the root of that of the great vessels, they are continuous. Next, the space between this, yes at the root of the great vessels. The visceral layer is then that layer which is adhered to that of the heart. Then we discussed about the cavity that is a pericardial cavity. Is a space between the two layers that is a parietal layer and the visceral layer. There is a potential space which is called as pericardial cavity which contains a thin film of capillary fluid. This is about the serous pericardium. So we have done about the fibrocerous sac that which is covering that of the heart. So, that is about the fibrocerous pericardium. Next, coming to that of the sinuses or pericardial sinuses. Means, whatever you are seeing, what we have said, heart is covered by pericardium. Yes, heart is covered by pericardium. But within that pericardium also, there are some spaces or there are some gaps or the spaces that spaces are called as the sinuses. So, these spaces what you are seeing are called as that of the sinuses. So, these spaces, sinuses is a space. So, when you see in the face also, we say we have sinusitis. So, because there is an uh, empty space, uh, frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoidal air sinuses are present because there are air filled spaces. Same way, within the heart also, that heart, that covering layer of the pericardium also is having some spaces. That spaces are called as sinuses. So, these are called as pericardium. So, as they are present in the pericardium, so these gaps or these spaces are called as pericardial sinuses. So, whenever there is a reflection, we said mm, the, uh, the serous pericardium is having two layers visceral and the parietal. So, whenever we are reflecting the reflection of visceral layer of the pericardium, it is unsparable or if it is reflected, you get two sinuses there which is called as one as a transverse sinus, one as a oblique sinus. So, you can get two spaces. One is a transverse sinus, one more is a oblique sinuses. 
so there are the sinuses of the pericardium are two that is one is transverse one more is the oblique i think by the name itself you say can say it transverse means if it is transversely present the sinus is called as transverse sinus when the sinus is oblique yes oblique in position then it is called as oblique sinus yes when you see clearly how it is formed this is a developmental part ma so when the heart the heart is formed by the two heart tubes so two heart tubes they join in between that joining when the two heart tubes are joining so these you can see these two heart tubes when they are joining in midway for your understanding there are gaps which are present so that gaps gradually what has happened is transferred into the of the sinus so this are called this sinus is called as a transverse sinus this is called as a oblique sinus so heart is developed by that of the two heart tubes you can see this two heart tubes which are fusing here yes so in between that there are small gaps so that gaps as we have said sinuses are the gaps so that gaps are forming as a two sinuses one is a transverse sinus one more is the oblique sinus let's see what are the boundaries of a transverse sinus and what are the boundaries of that of the oblique sinus that you are getting in that of the pericardium yes so this is a transverse sinus transversely it is present so this is a transverse sinus the transverse sinus is bounded in front by so this is the boundary in front is the ascending aorta next so this is the aorta next is the pulmonary trunk so in front the transverse sinus is bounded by ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk behind it is bounded by means of superior vena cava so this is superior vena cava and the pulmonary veins so these are the pulmonary veins so behind it is bounded by means of the superior vena cava with that of the pulmonary veins on either side the transverse sinus is open it is open you can see it is open on that of the the side just to see when you are coming across the boundaries of the transverse sinus so this is the transverse sinus ma in front is the arch of aorta and the pulmonary trunk behind is that of the inferior vena cava and with that of the pulmonary veins on each side it is open so here you can see this is a transverse sinus that we were discussing the sinus is a horizontal gap this is a horizontal gap which is present between the arterial end of the heart tubes in front and venous end so this heart tubes it is present between the arterial end of the heart and the venous so these are the arterial end of the heart tubes that is the arch of aorta and the pulmonary trunk whereas these are the of your veins these are the veins between the artery and the vein there is a gap yes so these are the it is present so this is a sinus which is present between the two tubes this is the arterial tube and this is a venous tube what you are seeing so between the two tubes that you are seeing this is a gap so it is present between the arterial tube and the venous tube so in between that that horizontal gap that you are seeing is called as a transverse sinus which is present between two tubes arterial tube and the venous tube yes so it is present between the that gap is present between the two tubes that is the arterial and the venous so when you see the boundaries it is present between the two tubes what we are saying so anteriorly is ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk posteriorly is the superior vena cava on each side it opens into that of the pericardial cavity so if you see here the boundaries anteriorly is the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk posteriorly is the superior vena cava on either side it is open into that of your pericardial cavity so these are the boundaries of the horizontal lee place sinus which is called as a transverse sinus the anteriorly is ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk posteriorly is a superior vena cava on each side it opens into the pericardial cavity proper so this is about the transverse sinus so whenever you are seeing see so we have introduced so the sinus is a gap yes what we have said as we have discussed so we are keeping our finger in, into that gap there is a gap there is a space so we have kept introduced our finger so in front so what we are saying 
it is the sinus is present between the two tubes the tube which is coming in front is the arterial tube the tube which is behind is a venous tube correct yes when you are seeing the relations anteriorly you can see that this is a iota this is a pulmonary trunk so anteriorly is ascending iota and the pulmonary trunk posteriorly is a superior vena cava so between these two tubes between the arterial tube and the venous tube there is a small horizontal gap you can see the index finger through which it is indicating that yes this is a gap which is present in the heart that within the pericardium of the heart that pericardium that that gap is called as a sinus which is called as a transverse sinus yes when you are seeing the boundaries i think this picture is very clear that which is showing that in front it is a iota and the pulmonary tract behind is a superior vena cava so these are the boundaries of the transverse sinus as such we have said there is one more sinus in the pericardium which is called as a oblique sinus so the sinus is present obliquely it is called as that of the oblique sinus which is present it is present behind that of the left ventricle so mo mostly when you are reflecting that of the reflections of the pericardium that is a visceral pericardium it is present behind that of the left ventricle it is present at the left atrium and the left ventricle the most the oblique sinus will be present at that part it is formed by the reflections of the pericardium whenever the pericardium is reflecting when this sinus is comes whenever there is a reflection of the pericardium at that time you can come across this oblique sinus so this oblique sinus is called as a caldi sac it is called as a close sac or the caldi sac what we are seeing it the relations are as such we have seen the transverse sinus anteriorly is the um, pulmonary trunk and the iota posteriorly is the superior vena cava same way the oblique sinus anteriorly is a atrium that is left atrium you will be coming so you have to say if the left atrium is present behind the left atrium is the oblique sinus will you will be getting it so anteriorly is the left atrium posteriorly is the pericardium that is the parietal layer of the, of the pericardium you will be getting so anteriorly is that of the left atrium posteriorly will, will be the parietal pericardium next below it opens into the pericardial that is proper that is pericardial cavity it will be opening so this is about that of the oblique sinus or the caldi sac that you are remembering that you are seeing it only remember when you are seeing it yes ma so when you are seeing it so transverse sinus is a sinus which is present between the two tubes that is the arterial tube and the venous tube if you ask me here madam where will be that of your oblique sinus you will be getting it yes so this is that of the right atrium this is a right ventricle here you will be getting because if you go back it is a left atrium and that of the left ventricle or the left auricle or that of your left ventricle yes four chambers so oblique sinus is that sinus which is present behind that of the left atrium or the left auricle so if you go behind the left atrium or the left auricle you can see this sinus which is called as this is behind my we have gone behind and see so when you are seeing the reflections of the pericardium behind the left atrium then you will be getting this oblique sinus the oblique sinus is present behind the left atrium so whenever we are seeing the boundaries because of that it is present behind anteriorly is a left atrium posteriorly is a parietal layer because uh, serous pericardium is again divided into parietal layer and the visceral layer so visceral layer only it is splitting where we are getting the oblique sinus so posteriorly it will be the parietal pericardium so anteriorly is a left atrium posteriorly is a parietal layer of the pericardium so in between these two layers what you are getting is a oblique sinus you will be seeing it so this is about that of your two sinuses transverse sinus and the oblique sinus now coming to that of the innervations that is blood supply and the nerve supply of the of the sinuses the blood supply of the not only sinus that is that of the pericardium blood supply for that of the pericardium is branches of the internal thoracic artery musculophrenic artery and descending thoracic artery so this is supplying the blood not only the arteries even the base you can say which is supplying to that of the pericardium so branches of internal thoracic artery musculophrenic artery and descending thoracic aorta 
is that which is supplying the blood to that of the pericardium same way when you see the nerve supply of fibrous and the parietal pericardium it is i think you can see I, I, earlier also we have said when we are studying about the fibrous pericardium they are supplied both are supplied innervated by that of the phrenic nerve which are pain sensitive means fibrous pericardium and the parietal layer of the serous pericardium are pain sensitive one more is we have said the serous pericardium is divided into parietal and the visceral the visceral pericardium is pain insensitive the visceral pericardium do remember the pericardium which is adherent to that of the heart is visceral it is pain insensitive insensitive to the pain do do uh, understand very clearly ma the fibrous and parietal peri layer of the pericardium is sensitive to the pain yes you can feel the pain of fibrous and the parietal layer of the pericardium but the visceral pericardium is insensitive to that of the pain so that is a nerve supply of the, of the pericardium yes the applied part of the, of the pericardium what is the applied part first is pericarditis it is anywhere it is called as inflammation so anywhere if you are saying it is it is it is inflammation inflammation of the pericardium is called as pericarditis so whenever the fibrous pericardium or serous pericardium due to any of the bacterial infections if it is inflamed it is called as that of the pericarditis yes one more is pericardial effusion if you remember our class between that of the serous pericardium the serous pericardium is again divided into parietal layer and visceral between the parietal layer and the visceral layer there is a small space which is called as pericardial cavity that pericardial cavity has a small capillary small amount of capillary fluid is present yes that is a normal part now coming what is pericardial effusion excess fluid if when there is that cavity is having more fluid and excess fluid within the pericardial sac it may lead to the cardiac tamponade that it can be like a like a water filled with yes pot a pot filled with that of your water yes if there is excess it so that part it can that pot like it can get it there so this is called as when there is excess fluid in the pericardial sac or the pericardial cavity you get a tamponade which is called as cardiac tamponade means that cavity if there is overfilling of the fluid is taking place then it is called as a tamponade which is called as a cardiac tamponade which is will be compressing the heart because of that overfilling because pericardium is the outer covering of the heart because when whenever it is overfilled the outer side is over it will be compressing that of the heart causing a pathological condition which is called as pericardial effusion one more applied is constrictive pericarditis what is this abnormal thickening of the pericardium that fibrocerus sac abnormally if it is thick thickened thickened yes and when it is if it is thickened okay if it is thickened when it is thickened and it is compressing the heart so the function of the heart is impaired so what you will get is because of thickening of the fibrous pericardium the fibrous pericardium got thickened what it happens it is called as constrictive pericarditis which is what it is causing is it is impairing the function of the heart the heart function is impaired so it is this is called as constrictive pericarditis so here you can see the pericardium the inflammation of the pericardium the first part which is called as pericarditis normally the fibrocerus sac should be a normal part whenever it is inflamed because of the bacterial or any of that of the uh, this one if it is inflamed it is called as pericarditis so this is what we are seeing the inflammation of the, of the heart so this is about the clinical part yes as such we have said between the two layers of the heart that is the serous pericardium there is a small gap which is called as a pericardial cavity that pericardial cavity should contain a small amount of fluid capillary fluid is present if more amount of fluid is present it causes a tamponade 
like as such i have said a pot filled with water that pot what you are seeing that over bulging of the up here pot here you can see that pericardial effusion or normally the pericardium in the sac itself it looks in this way but whenever there is a tamponade yes you can see the pericardial effusion in this way same way when you see the radiograph the tamponade looks in this way so this is a tamponade where you can see in the radiograph this is called as pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade what it is present so this is about the clinical part of the, of the pericardium yes before going to the external features of the heart let us first review about that of your once um, review about the uh, pericardium once again and uh, let's go to the external features of that of the heart so we have started the class so yes the class about the pericardium so we have started the class as pericardium what is pericardium covering of the heart is a pericardium this pericardium as such we have told it consists of two layers outer is a fibrous pericardium inner is a serous pericardium the inner serous pericardium is again divided into two layers outer parietal layer and the inner visceral layer so this is what you are saying this is the outer fibrous pericardium inner serous is again divided into outer parietal layer and the inner serous layer outer parietal layer and inner visceral layer in between these two layers there is a small gap which is called as a pericardial cavity is present so that is the first thing now we have uh, taken described the each pericardium in detail that is we have studied about the relations of this fibrous pericardium in the next slide so when you are seeing the fibrous pericardium what are the relations when you see the fibrous pericardium above at the upper part it is blending with the root of the great vessels when you come at the lower part it is blending with that of the diaphragm so this is the diaphragm that you are seeing it so this is the fibrous pericardium relations at the apex and at the of the lower part means at the upper and the lower part when you see front and behind the fibrous pericardium is attaching to that of the sternum by means of a ligament steno pericardium ligament posteriorly the fibrous pericardium is related to the esophagus and that of the bronchi so that is what we have described here apex is fused with the great vessels base fused with that of the diaphragm anteriorly attached to the sternum by means of steno pericardial ligament posteriorly it is related to the principal bronchi and esophagus on each side it is related to the pleura because lungs will be present on the each side it is called as media stain and pleura last is the nerve supply innervation it is innervated by the phrenic nerve the phrenic nerve is that nerve which is innervating the diaphragm and also it is innervating that of the fibrous pericardium next after this what we have seen is a serous pericardium the serous pericardium as such is a double layered membrane which consists of outer parietal and the inner visceral layer let's first i complete here it consists of a outer parietal layer and the inner visceral layer both layers that is the uh, serous pericardium are continuous at the root of the great vessels when you are seeing at the root of the great vessels both the layers of the serous pericardium are continuous at the root of the great vessels that might be the superior vena cava it might be the aorta or the pulmonary tract but two layers of the serous pericardium are continuous between these two layers there is a small gap that you can see which is called as a pericardial cavity is present here is the same thing that we were saying it is filled with a fluid which is called as that of the pericardial fluid is present so whatever the serous pericardium is a thin double layer membrane the outer layer is called as parietal layer the inner layer is a visceral layer 
The two layers, if you have seen that it is continuous with each other at the root of the great vessels, that great vessels might be ascending iota, superior mina cava, inferior pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary veins, but do remember they are continuous. The visceral layer is that layer which is adherent to that of the heart. So, it is also called as that visceral layer is also called as that of the epicardium. In between these two parietal layer and the visceral layer, there is a small cavity which is called as a pericardial cavity which is filled with a fluid which is, yes, filled with a capillary fluid which is called as pericardial fluid. So, this is about the serous pericardium. Yes. After the, what we have discussed is about the sinuses. That is two sinuses, transverse sinus and oblique sinus. Before going to it, what is a sinus? We have to know what is a sinus. The sinus is a gap. Where this gap is present? That gap is present in the pericardium. So, that gap is present in the pericardium. So, this gap which is present in the pericardium are of two types. One is transverse which is called as transverse sinus. One more is oblique which is called as oblique sinus. So, here you can see the transverse sinus. One more sinus at this part which is called as oblique sinus. When you say it, where this transverse sinus is present. So, if you are seeing here, the transverse sinus is present between the two tubes. One is the arterial tube, one more is the venous tube. That is this thing, I think you knew it, this is iota and the pulmonary trunk. Between the iota and the, in front will be the iota and the pulmonary trunk. Behind will be the superior vena cava. So, in front is ascending iota and the pulmonary trunk. Behind will be the superior vena cava. Between these two tubes, there is a gap which is present. That gap is called as a sinus, which is called as a transverse sinus. So, this is a transverse sinus. Same way, when you see the oblique sinus, yes, which is a closed sac, do remember this oblique sinus is present behind the left atrium. So, behind the left atrium, you are getting to see the oblique sinus. So, when you are seeing the relations of this oblique sinus of the culti sac, we say in front is the left atrium because it is present behind the left atrium. So, the relation goes on as in front as a left atrium, behind is a parietal layer of the pericardium. On either side, again it is a cavity proper that is pericardial cavity. So, that here the, those are the things about that of the sinuses. Yes, the last was that of the vasculature of that of the pericardium. The blood supply for the pericardium is internally it is by internal thoracic artery and musophrenic artery and descending thoracic iota. These are the branches. Now coming to the nerve supply, do remember the fibrous pericardium and parietal layer of the pericardium is supplied by the phrenic nerve. They are sensitive to the pain. I think you do understand what is sensitivity. So, they are sensitive to the pain. You can feel the pain. So, the phrenic nerve which is applied is sensitive to the pain that is fibrous pericardium and parietal. Whereas, the visceral pericardium is insensitive to the, that, the visceral pericardium which is adherent to that of the heart which is also called as epicardium is insensitive to that of the pain. So, this is about that of the pericardium. Yes. Now, let's go with that of the external features of that of the heart. So, before going it, the applied part what we have discussed here is the three things that we have got to know is one is pericarditis, one more was pericardial effusion. So, itis is inflammation. So, we have told the inflammation of the pericardium. One more is the effusion. If there is more amount of fluid or the excess fluid in that cavity is called as pericardial sac which is forming as a tamponade which is called as cardiac tamponade both because of which which is compressing that of the heart because of that tamponade it compresses the heart and it causes a heart functions are impaired because of this one. So, this is a part of applied at your part means at the part of your part. Ma. So, this is a part of the applied of the pericardium. Yes. Yes, let's see that of the external features of that of the heart. What are that of the external features of the heart? So, you have seen up till now the coverings of that of the heart you have seen. Now, let us see the what are the features of that of the heart, external features of the heart. 
Yes. Whenever we say the heart, the heart is a hollow muscular organ. Uh, do remember, whenever we say heart, what the heart is made up of? The heart is a hollow muscular organ. It is a muscle by which the heart is made. First. Next, when you see the situation of the heart, the heart is situated in the middle mediastinum. Because in the thoracic cavity, there is mediastinum is present. So, it is present in the middle mediastinum. As such, now presently we have discussed that one. Enclosed by the covering, that enclosed by means of the covering, which is called as a pericardium, which is a fibrous and serous, yes, fibrocerous covering, it is present. Next, when you see the shape, some places the heart shape it is pyramidal or you can also say it is conical in shape. Some places it also says it is the size of the fist. Yes, but whatever it might be, it is conical or pyramidal in shape. When you see the situation, means when you see its situation, it is present obliquely behind the sternum. So, behind the sternum it is not in the straight. In the straight part, it is present little bit obliquely. You can see it is present in the oblique. It is not aligned in a straight manner. It is present obliquely. So, obliquely it is present behind the sternum. Adjoined to the top here, either side, there are postal cartilages, means ribs. In behind the sternum, either side of the ribs, it is present. When it is present in that way, you can say this is a present behind the sternum. Either side, you will be getting the ribs. So, you can see on the right and the left side, Right side, it is only about one third of the heart is coming to the left. Right side, two third of the heart comes to that of the left side. So, you understand the heart is not present in the middle. In the thorax, in the middle part, it is not present. So, so that one third of the heart, it is situated obliquely in such a way that one third of the heart is to the right medial plane. Two third of the heart is to the left. It means most of the heart is lying to the right and left. It is mostly to that of the left side what we will be seeing. So, two-third of the heart is to the left, only one-third of the heart is coming to the, to the right side. So, when you are seeing it here also, this is the part, the one-third is coming towards the right side and two-third of the heart is to the, to the left side. So, this is about the introduction of the heart. So, whenever we are speaking about the heart, do remember it is a muscular organ situated in that of the middle media stadium. Covered by a covering which is a fibrocerus that is a pericardium. When we say it, it is present behind the sternum and either side of the postal cartilages. The thing to be remembered is heart is not present aligned in a strict manner in a straightly. It is present obliquely. The obliquity is saying that the one third of the heart is coming to that of the right side and two third of the right is coming to that of the left side. So, most of the heart comes to the, to the left part only, it is not in the midline. That is a point that you need to understand. Now, coming is the orient, what you have that everybody, what is heart, what does it consist? Yes, we say yes, it consists of chambers of the heart. Chambers, that some rooms are present. Yes, heart is composed of some chambers. That is, four chambers are present within the heart. That is, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium and the left ventricle. So, these are the four chambers which are present in the heart. Yes, blood returning to the heart. So, the venous blood which is returning to the heart. So, this is that of your right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, if most of the left atrium goes behind olima. So, there only you will be seeing the sac or the what we are saying as a, uh, oblique sinus. Next, this is the WM left ventricle. So, these are the chambers of the heart. Right atrium, right ventricle. This is left ventricle. The above will be that of the left atrium will be there. These are the four chambers of the heart. Yes, sir. Blood returning to the heart enters the atria and is then pumped to the WM ventricles. So, the blood which is returning. So, superior vena cava receives the blood from the upper part that is the head and the brain. The venous blood is entered into the right atrium. Same way, the inferior vena cava brings the blood from the lower half, lower part of the body into the right atrium. From right atrium, this deoxygenated blood enters from the right atrium to the top of the right ventricle. 
So that is what it is saying. The blood returning from the heart, returning to the heart, that is a deoxygenated blood enters the atria and then pumped into the ventricles. From the ventricles, if you see whether it is the right side or the left side, when you see on the right side, from the right atrium, the venous de uh, deoxygenated blood which has entered into the right atrium, from there it is entered into the right ventricle. Same way when you are going to the left side, the left side, the blood which you are getting into the heart is oxygenated blood. It is coming from the top of the lungs. That oxygenated blood enters into the top of your left atrium, from left atrium to the top of the left ventricle. So here it is the oxygenated pure blood. This is what you are getting is the impure deoxygenated blood. So from here, from the right side, where it is going? From the right side, the blood is entering to the top of the pulmonary trunk, from the pulmonary circulation via the pulmonary arteries. But whereas the left side from the left ventricle, it is going into the iota, it enters into the whole of the body which is forming as a systemic circulation. So when you see here, so this is a venous blood which has entered into that of the right atrium. From the right atrium, it is a right ventricle. From here, it is goes into that of the lungs by a pulmonary trunk. So this is a pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is taking into the top of your lungs. You can see here, it is a, this is a pulmonary trunk. Ma. It is taking the blood into the top of the lungs because blood is purified here. After the purification of the blood, it is again entering into the top of the left atrium. From the left atrium into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it again, again enters into the top of the superior, that is the arch of iota. It enters into the arch of iota. From the iota, it goes over and distributes to whole of the top here. So this circulation is called as which one which is going into the lungs is called as pulmonary lung circulation. The one which is going into the top here iota from the left ventricle to the top of the iota is called as systemic circulation because system by it is going to each and every system. So that circulation is called as systemic circulation. Whereas one which is going into the top of the lung is called as pulmonary circulation. If you do remember the uh, yesterday's class, there is one more circulation which is called as coronary circulation. That one which is heart is supplied by means of the artery which is called as a coronary artery, right and the left coronary artery. The heart in itself is getting its blood supply by means of these two arteries that is right and left coronary artery. So that type of circulation is called as of the coronary circulation. Yes. Yes, what we can see here in this picture is, so have the orientation, this is a superior vena cava, this is an inferior vena cava, uh, before that both you can see superior and the inferior vena cava are opening into that of the right atrium. So this is, we say uh, heart is having four chambers, so this is a right atrium, this is a right ventricle. this is a left auricle, our left atrium will be behind, so that is the left auricle beneath or below in front you can see the left ventricle more than that of the left auricle so this at this part is that of the left ventricle so this is a left ventricle this is a left auricle yes the tubes that you are seeing at the upper part is this one is a superior vena cava this is the iota ascending iota arch of iota then descending iota this trunk is called as a pulmonary trunk so this is a pulmonary trunk the tube which is present below at the base is called as an inferior vena cava. So this is an inferior vena cava, this is a superior vena cava, arch of iota, pulmonary trunk. Yes. When you see the shape and measurements of the heart, as such we have said the earlier when we are starting the external features of the heart, the shape of the heart is more also pyramidal or conical in shape. It is Conical or pyramidal in shape. When you see the measurements at the length wise, it is about 12 centimeters in length and width is about 9 centimeters. So when you see the length of the heart, it is 12 centimeters in length and the width is the width that is the thickness is about 9 centimeters in thickness. The weight of the heart is 300 grams in males, whereas 250 grams in Means so about approximately 250 to 300 grams it is present. Yes, it is somewhat larger. Normally we say the weight is 300 to means 250 to 300 grams, but it is it depends upon the fist. 
So heart is somewhat larger than one's own clenched fist. So whatever you are seeing above that, that of your fist, the size of the fist, it will be somewhat more than that of the fist size. Not only approximately if you don't say it is the size of the fist, yes, it can be a, a, a little bit bigger also, but it will be more, a little bit more than that of the fist size. So, but the size of the heart, when you see the weight, it is weighing around 250 to 300 grams, varying in males and females. In males, it is about 300, but in females, it is about 250 grams. Next, coming to the external features of the heart, what are the external things or the external features of the heart? It consists of two things, that is the apex is present, base is present, four surfaces, four borders are present. The four surfaces are stenocostal surface, diaphragmatic surface, right and left pulmonary surface. The borders that you get is right, left, superior and inferior. Don't be panic. I will try to show each one. So as such we have said, the heart has, that is only the features. The class itself is the features of the heart. So let's see, introduce uh, the heart. What are the features that it is? So this thing, what you are seeing is the apex of the heart. So this is the apex of the heart. Where normally we keep the step there. See the apex beat. So yes, we keep on the left side of the heart and here the some beat. So that is the apex beat. So this is that of the apex of the heart. So this is the apex of the heart. So opposite to the apex is the base. This is the base. Normally whenever we say apex is the high point. But in the heart do remember this is the apex now. It is not at the upper part. It is at the lower part. Yes sir. So this is the apex. Opposite to the apex this will be the base. Mark. So this is the base of that of the heart. This is the base of that of the heart. This is the apex of the heart. Yes. Yes. So first we have said the apex base. I think you do understand where is apex. So this is the apex of the heart. These things where you are seeing superior vena cava, where you are seeing the iota, pulmonary trunk. So this comes as another base. So this is the base of the heart. This is the apex of the heart. Yes. Next. Four surfaces, stenocostal, diaphragmatic, right and left pulmonary surfaces. Yes. When you see here this surface. So this surface is called as sternocostal surface because in front of the heart would be the sternum either side of the sternum will be the ribs so this surface is related to the sternum with the ribs so this is called as sternocostal surface the one surface which is beneath this surface is called as that of the diaphragmatic surface because it is lying on the diaphragm it is lying on the diaphragm so this surface is called as a diaphragmatic surface this is sternocostal surface. This surface is called as diaphragmatic surface. One more is right and left pulmonary surface because on the either side, right side lung will be present, left side also <coughs> lungs. So these are called as right pulmonary surface and the left pulmonary surface. Some books say as right and left. Otherwise, you can say only as two surfaces, sternocostal and the diaphragmatic surface. So this surface is a sternocostal surface. And this surface is a diaphragmatic surface. Next, coming to that of the borders of the heart. So, when you are seeing right, left, superior, inferior, four borders. So, here when you see, so this is the right side. So, this is the right border of the heart. This is the left border of the heart. This is the superior border of the heart. And this is the inferior border of the heart. So, in this way, heart is having four borders. Right border. Left border, superior border, this border will be the superior regular border, this is the inferior border. So, in this way, there are four borders of the heart. So, these are the external features of the heart. I am repeating again, ma. the external features of the heart includes apex, base, surfaces and borders. So, this is called as the apex. This is called as an apex. This is called as a base. This is a base. This surface is called as stenocostal surface. This surface is called as diaphragmatic surface. On either side it is called as right and left pulmonary surface. The borders are 
this border is called as a right border this border is called as a left border this is the superior border and this will be the inferior border of the heart so these are the external features of the heart now let's see each feature what it is made up of what is the importance the apex of the heart is conical yes when you see the apex yes this is the apex of the heart yes this is conical in shape conical in shape most of the apex is formed by what chamber because when you see the chambers of the heart this is a right atrium this will be the right ventricle this is a left auricle and this will be the left ventricle so most of the apex is formed by the left ventricle of the heart so when you see it most of the apex on is formed by that of the left ventricle the apex is the conical in shape it is formed by means of that of the left ventricle so this is what it is forming so this is a right atrium this is what you are seeing is a right ventricle next here you will be seeing the left part left atrium or the left auricle so this is a left ventricle when you see the apex so this is the apex which is formed mostly or purely by means of a ventricle which is called as that of the left ventricle yes and the one more point of the apex is the apex is directed downward and forward to that of the left so when you see the apex it is directing downward it is directing downward forward to the left side because this is the right side this is the left side so it is directing towards the left downward forward and to that of the left uh, do remember the heart is present obliquely so when you see the apex it is directing downward forward and to that of the left side okay. it is located at the fifth left intercostal space so whenever we are keeping the see the apex beat so when you want to see the apex beat whenever the doctors want to see the apex beat at what point they keep that of the uh, diaphragm is the at the level of the fifth left fifth intercostal space so this apex comes approximately might be one or two centimeters depends upon the age of the person but it is present at the left mostly at the upper fourth through fifth fifth intercostal space the apex beat can be heard mostly at the of the level of fifth intercostal space so fifth intercostal space it is from the midline it is about 9 cm away from the midline or from the mid clavicular line so when you take it from the midline from the midline so if you place it here the clavicle from the clavicle to the apex it will be about 9 cm away from the midline you will be getting the apex beat which is at the level of fifth intercostal space so about apart 9 cm away from the midline you will be hearing hearing that that of the apex beat so that is about that of the apex so whenever you are telling about the apex the apex is conical in shape so it is conical in shape mostly formed by that of the left ventricle so it is mostly formed by the left ventricle its direction is when you see that it is downward and that of your forward it is forming downward and that of the forward one more you can get the apex beat at the level of fifth intercostal space it is about 9 cm away from that of the midline yes this is about that of the apex next yes as already stated the apex beat so at the fifth intercostal space what you can hear is that of the apex beat can be heard which is about 9 cm away from that of the midline so it is the outermost and the lowermost thrust of the cardiac contraction there you are getting the apex beat is it is the outermost and the lowermost part of the cardiac contraction because the whole of the apex when you have seen it is formed purely by means of the left ventricle ventricle itself is forming the apex so whenever there is a systole ventricular systole at that time you are getting to hear that of the beat so it is felt at that of the fifth intercostal space that part where you are getting that impulse is called as maximum cardiac impulse normally the apex beat is felt at the fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line and on the left side of the of the heart yes this is what the apex be and about the apex of the heart next 
Yes. The apex is pyramid pointing toward the anterior inferior direction. Now coming to the base. The base is opposite to that of the apex. So opposite to the apex, what you are getting to see is that of the base. So this is the apex. So opposite to the base, apex, what you are seeing. So this is that of the base that you are seeing. So this is the base of the heart. It is opposite to that of the apex. Now coming to that of your surfaces. As we have said, the surfaces are stenocostal surface. Typically anatomical orientation, the heart has four surfaces. Actually, we can say stenocostal surface and the diaphragmatic right and left pulmonary. You can say but stenocostal and that of the diaphragmatic surface. When you see the stenocostal surface, the stenocostal surface is mostly formed by that of the right ventricle. So, if you see here the pic, so this surface is called a stenocostal surface, whole of the surface. So, most of the stenocostal surface is formed by that of the right ventricle. Only a part is formed by the left ventricle and the right atrium. So, right atrium and the left ventricle is only part. But most of the stenocostal surface is formed by right ventricle. Next. Diaphragmatic surface. Both right and left ventricles. So, this ventricle is called as right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. Both right and left ventricle both contribute to form a surface which is called as that of the diaphragmatic surface. So, diaphragmatic surface is formed by that of the one third is formed by the right ventricle, two third is formed by that of the left ventricle. Yes. One more thing. After that of your surfaces, so uh, the right and left pulmonary surfaces, I think borders you are clear only. Uh, this is called as a right border. Ma. So this is a right border. This is an inferior border. Left border. This is a superior border. Superior, inferior, right and left. So up till now what we have done in the external features is we learned about the apex. We have learned about the base. We have seen the surfaces such as stenocostal surface and the diaphragmatic surface. Right and left pulmonary also. But four borders. Right border, inferior border, left border and the superior border. Next. Other than that, in the heart, when you come across external features, there are some sulci are present. There are some sulci. Sulci, these are grooves which are present. The heart is a hollow structure where there are four chambers. That four chambers are the divisions or because of this only. So, this is called as the sulci are coronary sulcus and anterior and posterior interventricular sulci. So, what you can see? So, this is one sulcus, coronary sulcus. This is anteriorly it is present, anterior between the two ventricles. This is right ventricle, this is left ventricle. So, between the two ventricles, anteriorly it is present, so anterior interventricular sulcus. Same way if the sulcus is present on the posterior side, if not, it will be present. The sulcus is called as posterior between the two ventricles, then it is called as posterior interventricular sulcus. So, when you see the coronary sulcus, so this is the coronary sulcus that you have seen. So, this is a coronary sulcus that you are seeing it. What is this? Is the coronary sulcus runs transversely around the heart. So, you have seen it is running transversely. It represents the walls which is dividing atria and ventricle. So, the chambers what you are seeing as four chambers, that four chambers are separated because in the room, in home also, one room is separated by other by means of a walls. Yes, same way in the heart also, what is the demarcating between the atria and the ventricles are the sulci. So, these are the sulcus. So, the coronary sulcus is that one which is dividing atria from that of the ventricles. So, when you see here, so this is the atria, this is the ventricle. So, atria is separated from that of your ventricle, the atria is separated from that of the ventricle by means of a sulcus. So, this is called as a coronary sulcus which is dividing the atria from that of the ventricle. Next, this sulcus contains an important vasculature such as right coronary artery. So, if you remember it, yesterday we have said in the circulation there are three types that is coronary circulation is there, systemic circulation is there, pulmonary circulation is there. In the coronary circulation, the heart is supplied by the artery which is called as right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. So, within the coronary circus, what is passing through is, is the right coronary artery 
passes through the coronary sulcus. So the important vascular or the blood vessel which is present in the coronary sulcus is a right coronary artery in the passing. So when you are saying this is also called as this coronary sulcus is also called as atrioventricular groove. Between the atria and the ventricle there is a groove which is present called as atrioventricular groove. This groove is present transversely between the atria and the ventricle. So when you see the coronary sulcus what is passing through this sulcus is a coronary artery that is called as right coronary artery traverses through that of the coronary sulcus. Yes that is about the coronary. Now coming to the one more sulcus that is called as anterior or posterior interventricular sulcus. It is present the name itself it is uh, suggesting that if it is present anteriorly it is called as anterior interventricular sulcus because it is present between the two ventricles so it is called as anterior. If it is present in the posterior between the two ventricles then it is called as posterior interventricular sulcus. So in the heart external features of the heart there are two sulcus one is the coronary sulcus one more is the anterior intervent anterior or posterior interventricular sulcus. Same coronary sulcus is also called as atrioventricular sulcus because the coronary sulcus is that sulcus which is dividing the atria from the ventricle. So it is called as atrioventricular groove and one more is called as anterior and posterior interventricular sulcus. Yes. After this, after the sulci, next let us go to that of the base of the heart. So what is this base? So we have seen the apex. After the apex, we have seen about the sulci. What are the sulcus which are present? What is the important thing? Let us see about the base of the heart. The base of the heart is composed of, when you are seeing it is consists of two atria. Mostly it is that of the left atrium. Only a part is formed by that of the right atrium. So when you are seeing, so this is the base mark. So this is a base. Mostly it is formed by that of the left atria. This is the left atria you will be getting it. Partly it is by means of that of the right atria. So the base is a is that thing which is formed by that of your two atria. Primarily it is by means of the left atria. Two third of the base is composed of posterior surface of the left atrium. So whenever we are saying mostly the base is formed by left and only a small part is formed by right atrium. So two third of the base is formed by that of the left atrium whereas one third is formed by that of the right atrium. So when you see the base it is directed backward and to the right. If you see the apex it is directing forward. It is directing forward whereas the base is directed backward. So this is backward to the right whereas this is directing forward to the left side. The apex is directing forward to the left. Base is directing backward to the right side. So this is to the backward and to the right. Yes. Yes. Where is the base located? Opposite to the apex. So you have seen that up here base at this part. So this is the base part what we have saw. This is the apex part. Opposite to the apex what you are seeing is a base. So the base is that one which is situated opposite to that of the apex. So opposite to the apex what you are getting is that of the base. It is located opposite to that of the apex. It is located in front of the fourth thoracic vertebrae. So the base is located in the erect posture. So when the person is dying in the top here, one vertebrae in the erect posture, T6 to T9 are in the mid thoracic lying down position. It is present in the middle of the fourth thoracic vertebrae. It is present in front of the fourth, that is T5 to T8. Whenever you are speaking, so this is a base. It is coming, so when it is related to that of your vertebrae, it is coming in between that of your T5 to T8 thoracic vertebrae, the base will be present at that level. Yes. Yes, the base is separated from the vertebral column by means of the sinuses because earlier we have seen it is by means of the cul sac or the oblique pericardial sinus, esophagus and iota. The base is separated from that of the vertebral column. So when you see it, so here the vertebral column, so this is the base. The base is separated from the vertebral column by means of, so that it is separated by means of the pericardial sinus, esophagus and iota. 
the base is formed by when you are seeing here the base is formed by superior vena cava that is great vessels aorta and the pulmonary tract so the base is formed by when you are seeing here it is formed by superior vena cava aorta and the pulmonary tract so it is composed of two atria that is right atria and the left atria mostly the left atria is forming two third of the base is formed by the left atria only one third is forming the right atria other than that the base includes the tubular structures such as superior vena cava aorta and the pulmonary tract yes after the apex and base let's now see the surfaces that is a steno costal surface what is the steno costal surface the steno costal surface is created primarily by means that surface is formed mostly by the right atrium and right ventricle both right atrium and the ventricle if you see it so this surface is a steno costal surface what you are seeing yes this is a steno costal surface the steno costal surface is mostly formed by right atrium right ventricle and a part of the of the left ventricle so these three chambers are forming the steno costal surface but the right atria is separated by the right ventricle by means of a sulcus which is called as that of the coronary sulcus or it is also called as atrioventricular sulcus yes the two ventricles are separated by anteriorly so it is a anterior interventricular sulcus remember this one yes when you see that of the uh, steno costal surface the steno costal surface wait ah yes the steno costal surface is formed by that of the right atrium primarily by the right atrium right ventricle both atria as such we have described the right atria and the right ventricle is separate separated by means of a sulca at the groove which is called as a atrioventricular groove the atrioventricular groove separates the atria from that of the ventricle so this is a atrioventricular groove or that of the coronary sulcus which is separating the atria from the ventricle first next the steno costal surface is also partly created by the left auricle and the left ventricle so mostly it is the right atrium and the right ventricle but a part of it is also formed by the left ventricle the left ventricle is sub is separate is divided from left ventricle by means of a groove means both the ventricles the right ventricle is separated from the left by means of a groove which is called as that of the anterior interventricular groove the same thing i was saying is both are separated by a groove which is called as that of the interventricular groove yes one more thing in the steno costal surface the left atrium if you see the left atrium here in the picture you can't see the left atrium very clearly here because this is a right atrium this is the right ventricle here this is the left ventricle but you can't see the left atrium here why it is behind that of the pulmonary trunk behind the pulmonary trunk that auricle on the left auricle will be present so it is not seen very clearly so the left atrium is hidden on front of the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk so it is present there at that part it is hidden behind the aorta and the pulmonary trunk the part of the steno costal surface is uncovered by means of the left lung creating the area of the superficial cardiac dullness so when you are resonant the resonance sound what you are hearing, uh, hearing is uh, it is uncovered by means steno costal surface is covered covered by that of the left lung so because of it you hear a note which is called as cardiac dullness is present superficially but strictly speaking for you what is the steno costal surface is the steno costal surface is a surface which is formed by a part of the right atrium mostly formed by the right ventricle both right atrium and ventricle are separated by means of a groove which is called as atrioventricular groove or the sulcus which is called as coronary sulcus and other than this atria right and left right atria and the right ventricle even the steno costal surface is also formed by your left ventricle and a part of that of the left auricle so both the left ventricles means left ventricle is separated from the right by means of a groove or the sulcus which is called as the anterior interventricular sulcus which separates that of the two ventricles that is right ventricle and that of the left ventricle yes next after the steno costal surface let's do about the yes 
diaphragmatics are face rather complex this yes yes four borders right border left superior and inferior border two groups one is a coronary sulcus one more the anterior interventricular sulcus four chambers right ventricle right atrium left ventricle and the left auricle these are the four chambers now coming to the diaphragmatic surface of the heart yes this surface what you are seeing is called as a diaphragmatic surface of the heart when you see the diaphragmatic surface of the heart most of the diaphragmatic surface on the right side partly it is formed by that of the right atria but mostly it is formed by that of the right ventricle and that of the left ventricle the surface is flat which rests on the diaphragm diaphragmatic surface it is also because it rests on the diaphragm so it is called as diaphragmatic surface it is created by the right and the left ventricles so mostly it is the right and that of the left ventricle which are both are separated both the ventricles are separated by a groove which is called as a interventricular groove the left ventricle it is by two third of the left ventricle and one third of the right ventricle it is forming the diaphragmatic surface the diaphragmatic surface two third is formed by the left ventricle only one third is formed by means of the right ventricle so this is forming the surface which is called as a diaphragmatic surface of the heart yes so this is a back view of the heart so what we are seeing this is called as posterior interventricular sulcus that you are seeing here so when you are seeing the base two third is formed by that of the left ventricle only one third is forming that of the right ventricle what you are seeing is that of the left atrium so this is the left atrium you can see this veins that is a four pulmonary veins which are bringing the blood from that of the lungs to that of the left atrium so that blood which is oxygenated blood is brought from the lungs to that of the left atrium by means of this pulmonary vein so these are the four pulmonary veins which are opening into that of the left atrium so this is a left atrium this is that what which is forming as a left ventricle so this surface is called as a diaphragmatic surface so this surface is called as a diaphragmatic surface yes other than stenopostal diaphragmatic one more two surfaces are called right and left pulmonary surface the left pulmonary surface faces to the left lung yes whereas the right pulmonary surface faces to that of the right side so when you see the right pulmonary surface faces to the right left towards the left side so this is a right and left pulmonary surfaces which is present the left pulmonary surface is broad and convex and consists of left ventricle and a part of that of the left atrium so when you see the left pulmonary surface uh, wait yes when you see the left pulmonary surface this is the left pulmonary surface which is formed by a part of the left auricle and mostly by means of the left ventricle yes same way when you see for that of the yes when you see the right pulmonary surface which is facing to the right it mostly it is formed by the right surface is mostly formed by means of the right atrium so this is a right pulmonary surface you can see it it is purely formed by that of the only by means of the right atrium now coming to the borders as such we have described there are four borders so right border left superior and inferior border the right border is forming the right atrium yes so this is forming the right atrium which is mostly formed by the right atrium whereas uh, this is the border is called as the inferior border which is formed by left ventricle and the right ventricle left border is a left ventricle superior border is formed by right and left atria so when you see here yes this is the right border which is formed by so this is a right border which is forming the right atria it is purely formed by right atria this is what you are seeing is a inferior border which is formed partly by means of the top the right ventricle partly by means of the top the left ventricle this is the left border which is mostly by means of the top the left ventricle next this is a superior border which is formed by means of the top the right atria and mostly it is formed by the top the left atria two atrias here is also it is atria here it is a two ventricles here it is one ventricle which is forming that of your borders of the heart same thing ma 
right podoid is more or less vertical and it is mostly formed by that of the composed of the right atrium it extends from superior vena cava above to that of the inferior vena cava below if you see it so this is a right border which is purely formed by right atrium it is extending from superior vena cava above to that of the inferior vena cava below so that is a right border yes left border it is curved and oblique border so when you see it the left border is curved so this is a curved border or the oblique border that you are seeing so this is a left or the curved or the oblique border it is there yes it is mostly by the left ventricle and only part by means of the left auricle so when you see here it is mostly by means of this is whole is a left ventricle mark whole is a left ventricle mostly it is what my left ventricle only a part at the upper part is formed by that of the left auricle mostly it is a left ventricle which is forming that of the left border of the of the heart it extends from left auricle to the apex of the heart and separates the stenocostal surface and the left surface so it extends from that of the left auricle to that of the apex of that of the heart so the left border what you are seeing it is extending from the base so this is the base to that of the apex of the heart so this is a base and to the apex so this border is called as that of the left border of the heart yes now coming to the inferior border the inferior border is almost horizontal extends from the opening of inferior vena cava to the apex of the heart it is horizontal and it is extending from so when you are seeing is this is the inferior border it is horizontal extending from inferior vena cava so here you will get in the inferior vena cava to that of the apex of the heart so the inferior border extends from the inferior vena cava to that of the apex of that of the heart it is created mostly it is formed by what chamber mostly it is formed by the right ventricle because the right atrium is normally forming that of your right border of the heart so this inferior border is mostly formed by the right ventricle only a part is contributed by means of that of the left ventricle but mostly it is a right ventricle the right atrium also creates a part of the border but it is only a part the inferior border separates that border which separates the stenocostal surface from that of the diaphragmatic surface so the inferior border this is a inferior border so above the inferior border is stenocostal surface beneath the inferior border what you will be seeing beneath is the diaphragmatic surface so this is the border which is separating the stenocostal surface from that of the diaphragmatic surface yes near the apex the inferior border presents a notch termed as incisura cordis so at the apex part it forms a notch and there is a small notch which is called as incisura cordis so that is about the inferior border of the heart next the upper border yes the upper border is again oblique it is also oblique in shape so when you are seeing it the upper border is also oblique so this is the oblique so when you see here it is formed mostly by only a small part is formed by right atria but mostly it is formed by that of the left atrium left atrium is mostly forming that of your superior at the base of the or the upper border of that of the heart and the things that you can see here is you can see the arch of aorta you can see the superior vena cava you can see the pulmonary trunk at that of the superior border or the upper border so when you see the upper border it is oblique composed of it is made up of left and the right atria but mostly it is a left part is a right the upper border is obscured you can't see the upper border if you have seen there also the upper border is not so clear it is not clear it is obscured from the view on the stenocostal because ascending aorta pulmonary trunk is present so you can't say this border as such as a border it is not a clear border but when you are saying it as the features you say it but it is not a clear border you have to remember one that point the border is not like a border so that only it be called is as a obscured border to border where you can't see clear it is not a clear border on the surface of the body the upper border can be marked by means of the top the line joining the lower border of second coastal cartilage to the top of midline plane you can mark that part but the upper border is mostly formed by the top here part of it is formed by the top the left atria and a small part is formed by the top the right atria 
yes so that is about that of the external features of the heart so before coming to that of the the end part of the class uh, before going to the clinical part points ma heart sounds what are the heart sounds that i think this might be covered in the physiology part also a part a small part in that of the anat part so you you might have heard the apex beat at the fifth intercostal space yes there is uh, this is the tricuspid valve you will be getting here you will be getting the mitral valve so mitral valve sounds heard over the heart at the apex in the fifth intercostal space tricuspid valve sounds typically heard in that of the sternal margin so this is a sternal margin so aortic valve sounds at the second intercostal space whereas a pulmonary valve sounds are heard in that of the second so both aortic and pulmonary valve do remember it is at the level of second intercostal space if you have to hear the aortic valves or the pulmonary valves you have to hear at the second intercostal space whereas bicuspid and the tricuspid valves mostly at the top their fifth intercostal space you have to hear if it might be towards the right or the left so at the left it will be your apex beat to the right it is a tricuspid valve sound so you will be hearing it yes one more thing when you are seeing the x-ray that is a cardiac ray in x-ray of the chest pa view and uh, you can see the media uh, stainal shadow yes i have kept that one see here so this is the part that you can see here so this is part what it is indicating is a superior vena cava here is the inferior vena cava you will be getting across here so this part what you are seeing is the diaphragm so this is the part of the diaphragm so in radiograph what you see is our x-ray aortic arch pulmonary left auricle the right border from above downwards this can be seen so this is the radiogram how you can see a, the heart when taking the pa view so when you are taking the chest x-ray is that of the pa view of that of the chest you will be taking it before uh, wrapping up the class yeah so let's have uh, one point only on the external features um, it might be a light confusion for you uh, because the class was very extensive and that but the things to be remembered he is uh, here he is uh, so what we have discussed here is only the simple thing for you the external features uh, so at the first part i have said heart is a conical muscular organ yes it is located when you are seeing it is not in the midway mostly towards the left and only to the partly to that of your right side it is present and when you see the size of that of the heart normally we say it is the size of the fist but it is slightly larger than the fist size it is about 300 grams varying from male to the female in males it is about 300 but females it is 250 so we can say from it varies from 250 to 300 grams now coming to the features of the heart that was a very important thing here in the class it includes the apex so this is the apex this will be the base do remember very nicely this is the apex this is the base surfaces the surface is called as sterno costal surface the surface beneath is called as the diaphragmatic surface on the right side the surface is called as right surface on the left side it is called as left surface yes now coming to the borders this is the superior border this is the inferior border this border is called as a right border and this is a left border if you have this concept it is more than the inner we have discussed the same thing now coming to the groups this sulcus is called as coronary sulcus and this is called as anteriorly it is present it is called as anterior interventricular sulcus if it is present posteriorly it is called as posterior interventricular sulcus so these were the things that we have discussed here when we are saying about the apex what chamber because when you see here this is a right atrium ma this is a right ventricle right atrium right ventricle both are separated by means of a groove atrio ventricular groove or it is also called as coronary sulcus this is right ventricle this is left ventricle both are separated by a groove which is called as anterior interventricular groove yes now when you are saying the apex the apex is formed by part is formed by left part is formed by right yes this is left ventricle this is right ventricle what i was describing is the same ma so the apex mostly it is formed by left ventricle a part is formed by the right ventricle 
this apex bead if you are hearing with the stethis, uh, stethoscope where you can keep the apex you want to hear the apex bead you have to keep it at the level of fifth intercostal space which is about 9 centimeters away from the nephew mid blind so this is the apex when you are saying the base this is base uh, the base is irregular it is not so conspicuous so whenever you say the base what is the base is formed by again you say the base is formed by part is formed by the atria a part is formed by the top your right and part is formed by the left atria it consists of what it is present it consists of the top your vena cava iota pulmonary tract so this is forming the top your base now coming to the surface so this surface is called as tendo costal surface it is formed by a part is formed by right atria right ventricle only a part is formed by the top your left ventricle seeing this pic only you can see everything when you say the diaphragmatic surface so this is the diaphragmatic surface which is formed it is formed mostly by because when you see behind the heart so heart back part when you are seeing it the posterior surface of the heart yes when you see it it is formed by the top your ventricles so this is the diaphragmatic surface the diaphragmatic surface is formed by the top your two ventricles the right and the top the left ventricle next coming to the borders this is the right border which is forming by the right atria this is the left border which is formed by the left ventricle and only a part it is formed by the top your left atria this is the inferior border which is separating stenocostal surface from the diaphragmatic surface it is formed mostly it is formed by the top your right a ventricle and a part is formed by the top your left ventricle this is what you are seeing is the upper border the upper border is not so conspicuous though it is having it is formed by the top your two atrias and that what you are seeing the tubes of the of the heart so this was the external features other than that yes we have discussed about the grooves and the sulci so this is the uh, groove what you are seeing is the anterior interventricular atrioventricular groove and this is called as anterior interventricular groove this anterior atrioventricular groove is also called as coronary sulcus which where you can see the coronary artery which is called as the right coronary artery passes through the top here coronary sulcus yes yes ma this is about your uh, the external features of the heart yes with this we end that of the class if you have any doubts please keep it in your group so that we will be trying to clarify your doubts yes thank you S stay safe and secure thank you